Hello and welcome to episode 15 of Matchit and the Other Guy. And you join Kevin and me sitting outside my house in Charlotte, North Carolina, on a very sunny day. And I actually thought, Kevin, it was going to be a little bit chilly. Um, We've had a couple of below freezing mornings here recently, but actually today it's not bad at all. Yes, I think it's graced us with uh, proper recording uh, temperatures here on the porch. Yes, it has. Now, as always, I never know. I don't know why this little tradition started, but it has started, so we seem to continue it. I never know the subject of our conversation when we sit down, so certainly I can do absolutely no research, which um, I'm perfectly happy about. But I understand that today you have a very important public service announcement to make before we get started on our conversation. Yes, we think it's uh, very would be very interesting for the listeners to let us know any topic ideas they might have, things they might want us to discuss, any comments they may have, and so forth. I think it'll enhance our uh, product going forward. Yes. And the best way to do that is uh, email us at contact at matchitandtheotherguy.com. Yes, so all compliments and praiseworthy comments, please direct towards Steve, and all complaints, please direct towards Kevin. They are the correct departments, I think. Is that right? Uh, Sure. (laughs) Right. I think that's just been assigned. (laughs) So here we are, sunny day, Lake Wiley. What are we going to be talking about today? Well, following up on said comment, we are going to use someone's topic. We had uh, Gary H. sent us a tweet, and he said, I'd love to hear a discussion about bicycles. Bicycles, okay. And I can actually sink my teeth into this one. Yeah, so all right. Kind of. Uh, I like you know, that. I, I like that. What idea. kind you had growing up, and uh, first ones maybe, and yeah. your experiences. Everything bicycles. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, really, correct me if I'm wrong. And um, I, I, you know, I'm going to talk from my childhood experiences. So obviously, on the other side of the Atlantic, over in England, but the bicycle was really the first taste of on-the-road freedom, wasn't yeah, it, really? It was a way of getting away from, from home. Exactly. Yes, and um, of course, as I've said many times, and you know, and uh, it was certainly most definitely the case, we had very little spare money for things, luxuries like bicycles, but we all nevertheless had a bike at some point. All my school pals did, and my cohorts did, and my brother did, and... Uh, and I had one, but what, what I'm going to suggest to you is they were all cobbled together from bits and pieces. You know, they were all, as they say, bits of, uh-huh. you know, bits of this and bits of that. And we'd find an old frame and we'd clean it up and brush it off and paint it, usually with a hand brush. Uh-huh. And uh, then we'd have a couple of rusty wheels and eventually we'd all end up with something that looked a bit, you know, a bit weird. But it was a bike and off, off we went. And uh, yes, I do remember that very well. Yeah. How about you? What was your first bicycle? I, I definitely go way back, even before I can remember, uh, my parents, they swear up and down that I was riding a bike about two or three without training wheels, that I just took to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was this little, tiny, green bike, and uh, you, you probably aren't surprised to know that I still have it. <laughs> it's in the <laughs> attic. I, I'm not surprised by that. Yeah, I'm sure and you do. A few years ago, it, it's kind of funny, I was, I was looking at it again, and on the headset, you know, where the logo is, I can't remember the exact name of the company now, but... It said Dino, and oh, it's wow. in the exact Dino script that Ferrari used. No kidding. And it also says Made in Italy. So I said, that's where it all began. That's where the uh, Italian passion started for me, wow. apparently. So it's this little Italian bike, little tiny thing. I can't, you know, the, the wheels are probably like 12 inch or something like yeah. that. Uh, maybe even smaller. But that's how I got started. Have you researched that Dino bicycle? It seems like I did at the time. I need to pull it back down and, yeah. and look up that uh, the company that made it. Yeah, so it sounds like something you should definitely research. Yeah, but it's I mean, this little yeah, metallic y, kind of pea green yeah. little bike. And you know, I'll pull it out one day and let you take a look at it, too. Yes, well, we were also very fortunate, I, mean, I suppose fortunate in a way, coincidence, I suppose, more than anything, that uh, rally bicycles. Yeah. Uh, were, um, were, were were from Nottingham. I believe they were based in Nottingham, which when I was growing up was literally about 15 miles to the north of us. So uh-huh. yeah, I know there was, very well. yeah, there was a lot of rally bicycles uh, about uh, as a result of that. And almost everybody, I, I mean, I seem to remember almost everybody, most folks, you know, back in the early 1960s, most folks didn't have a car in our, in our little neighborhood, but all the um, all the chaps like when they were when they would go to work in the morning and, and mining was a great industry as we may have talked about before. There was an awful lot of coal mining um, around my 
my part of England. And one of the nearby towns was called Colville for obvious reasons, but there was a huge mining community there. But I just remember so many uh, you know, fully grown chaps would have a black rally three-speed bike with a brown leather saddle that they yep. would cycle to work on. You know, I mean, there were just hundreds of them about. And um, they also produced rally, if I remember right, the, f the f I want to say famous, I mean, I'm sure you had something very similar on this side of the Atlantic. It was called the Rally Chopper, which had a little front wheel and a, and a sort of big, chunky, almost like a little motorcycle-type rear yeah. wheel. And um, it was made to look like a, a chopper That was very much a motorbike. 70s. Yeah, yes, Very it much was, a 70s yeah. trend yes. here. And I can't. You know, I know there were chopper bikes, and I can't remember who yes. made them. I didn't know how many friends that particularly had that one. And they had that very distinctive um, motorcycle-type seat with a backrest on it that, you know, you could sort of... If a you, banana if, seat? If that's what the it long, would be called. Long, long, long video yeah, and a yep. sort of backrest Yeah, we call them banana seats here. Okay, so if you if you had a friend with you when you were cycling, and most most kids in playing around the villages in England always did, there'd be one of your mates sitting on the back, freeloading a, a ride, uh -huh. laying back on the, on the seat rest. But the most distinctive thing I always remember about the Rally Chopper, which made them such a cool... I mean, they were a really cool bike to have as a kid. Like, everybody wanted yeah. one. I couldn't afford one. My mum and dad were not going to get one for me. And I understand that. But one of the cool features was it had, like, a little gear lever, almost like a car-type gear lever to change mm. gears. On mounted the top two. On the, frame, on the top two, but the yep. frame. Yes. Now, early iterations of that, and you'll be a fan of this little bit of, of knowledge about Rally... Uh, chopper bicycles. The the early iteration, in my memory, had a correct um, car gear lever type gear knob on it. It was more round. It looked more like a golf ball type. It uh -huh. was like it was, it was a definite sort of round design. And later ones had a sort of a a, a red plastic or a black plastic T shift kind of thing, you know. And it was a different thing. Um, and I, I I don't know if that was just a design change or if there was a sort of safety aspect of you don't want this golf ball type thing right there on the top frame. I don't know. But I do remember they changed in latter years. And uh, you, if you really wanted a proper, legit uh, rally chopper, you wanted one that had that sort of more round car gear lever type knob on the top. Yeah, yeah the one the one here that was uh, that really harkens back to that and uh, have, have been, become highly coveted are the Schwinn Stingrays. Yes. You know, Schwinn has always been the, the major American company. Okay. And then they had uh, the Stingrays, and they were like that. They had a smaller wheel up front. They really yeah. didn't have a straight, long chopper thing yeah. as much, somewhat. But they had, definitely had the gear, banana seat, and a larger wheel in the back. Yeah. And they named them different, like the orange was called the Orange Crate. Oh, okay. And... Somewhere there's a, there's a Schwinn person listening, going, "Oh yeah, every color was named this, 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 and this, and knows right. everything there is to know about them." Yeah. But like they the have Mopar, become really plum, plum crazy and all that sort of exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they they were really a big deal. Uh, yeah. I personally didn't know anyone that had one. Again, in the seventies, I was still kind of young, so it wasn't me picking out my bikes at that point. Yeah, you know, I was still kind of just going with whatever my parents got me as I outgrew one into the other. And did those swim bicycles you're describing here, did they have that, um, in England, they were called ape hanger bars, you know, hanger bars. They, they did, were very yeah. tall and, you know, like, again. I think, again, I think you're right. I yeah, think they just, did. just like a sort of motorcycle. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's how the chopper was as well. Yeah. And I have a feeling, I may be wrong here, but again, this is the joy of um, the internet and, and Google and Wikipedia and all those search engines, is I have a feeling that the rally chopper has been um, remade fairly recently. You know, a sort of retro look. Yeah, it's worth looking at. Chopper, yeah, yeah, it'd be worth researching that. Yeah, uh, but they were boy. I mean, if you had a rally chopper, you know, you 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 know, you were quids in, as they say. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, that was the thing to have. But of course, we never. And they had the sort of um, little tassels dangling from the yep. handlebars as well. All of that stuff. You know, yeah. I mean, you'd you'd arrive. Sometimes the seat was glittery, and sometimes the handlebar grips were glittery. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So on the swim, I do remember that. On the on the rally chop, I seem to remember they were always just straight black plastic leather effect type seats. I don't remember any glittery effect on, but I know I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Well, and, and did you guys over in the states? Did you used to put um, um, bubble gum cards, baseball cards, in, in the in the spokes? So that, I think maybe so the generation ahead might have done all that. We we didn't. Um, yeah. We uh, my my bike experience. I had the little one I mentioned. Then I had a, a sidewalk bicycle which had pneumatic tires on it. And yeah. It was just it was just a bigger one. I just outgrew the other one. It had maybe a sixteen inch wheel. Yeah. Um, 
And then is when it kind of got interesting is I, my dad, my mom and dad always had older bikes. This was the 70s, and they had bikes from probably the 50s or 60s that they kept at the house. One was my sister. She had a J.C. Whitney, which I think was a Sears product. Okay. all right. And they had a Huffy. The Both of those had the working lights. You know, you could put batteries in the, the console attached to the head tube, and they had lights on the front. You'd click it. Oh, cool. You'd, and yeah. they had working lights. Yeah. And then along the lines, somewhere around that same time, Dad picked this one up somewhere called a, a Viking. And it was a, an older one. And uh, at the time, his bi- he, he had had a refuse business, a business at one time, and he'd gotten out of it. And later on, his, his business partner stayed in it a while and sold to BFI, Browning Ferris Industries, okay. which is like waste management, those type of things. Well, they always were known for this blue. So Dad just took the frame down to the, the mechanic shop down there at, at BFI and said, next time you're spraying something, spray this frame. So he comes home with this BFI blue Viking bike, reattaches all the components on it, and uh, so they had three uh, grown bigger 26-inch wow. yeah. bikes. It was too big for me, but I had that little sidewalk bike. So I still remember one evening, Dad just after dinner, you know, it was a summer, so there's still light out, and he suggested, well, you want to go for a bike ride, which we would do on occasion. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I went in there, and where the bikes were, and there was this brand-new Huffy 20-inch bike with a banana seat. Wow. So, so then I upgraded yeah. to, it wasn't anything like a Schwinn Stingray, but still, you know, it's it was, still a, pretty it was cool. a, a bigger bigger boy bike. And uh, I tell you, with that banana seat, you can wheelie the heck out of those things. Lean back on that seat and just kick <laughs> yes. that thing up. Yeah. And uh, so I had that uh, in my latter years in Tennessee before we moved to uh, <laughs> Florida. Yeah, that's amazing. So I was like 10, 11 <clears throat> around that time. Well, I remember uh, when I was growing up in England in the manor, uh, one of my brother's friends, he was an absolute daredevil. And uh, whatever whatever crazy stunt needed doing, my, my brother's friend from down at the village, would he'd be the guy that he'd do that. He'd jump off roofs and, you know, whatever whatever crazy thing, he, he was the guy for it. <clears throat> and so at the manor, because we had all this wonderful woodland, I remember my brother and his friend built this uh, crazy jump. I mean, it was a crazy high jump. So we'd come down a, 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 like a grass hill uh, in the in the woods, and then he, my brother and his friend had built this sort of ramp out of old logs. And so you come diving down, zooming down this hill up up the logs. And you know the 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 front of the ramp was probably a good six feet off the ground. So I mean, on a on a bike, even if you just fell off at the top, it was fairly high. And uh, I wouldn't go anywhere near it. I mean, I was just terrified looking at it. But my brother said, no, 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 no. My friend will do this. He's, 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 he's up for this. And it, they'd made another kind of um, stunt-looking bike, and they'd, they'd got big, long, extended forks on it. I mean, it's a quirky-looking thing, always like something out of a fairground. But my brother's friend gave this a go, and he went... And, it, and I remember he was wearing a, a real old-fashioned, like, 19... 19- 40s or 1950s motorcycle crash helmet thinking that this oh, is going to be quite the stunt <laughs> you know and it was one of those helmets that just came down like it was almost like a paratrooper helmet just above the ears and yeah. then you'd have the leather flaps that went yeah, down like a CHP so he came zooming down on this bike you know went up this up this ramp boom, went into the air and it was a, it was absolutely spectacular it was like wow you know this is this is unbelievable and as the bike <laughs> as he landed on the bike the bike I mean it just came apart into about 15 pieces <laughs> the front wheel went one way, the rear wheel went the other, the frame was cracked, you know. But um, he did survive, but I do remember that to this day. Very vivid memories of that day. Yeah. Is that a little bit of Evil Knievel influence? Oh, absolutely. Over there? Yeah. Absolutely, mm-hmm. no question. Because that's, about. yeah, that's definitely led me to some things, too. I, I'm going to have to jump back a bike, uh, that middle one, the, the pneumatic tire one. That was Evil <laughs> Knievel era. Yeah. So I got Dad's oil change ramp, put it at the bottom of the hill, and put one of my dump trucks in front of it. <laughs> And came barreling down, and you know, this get hard as a rock, pneumatic tires, and hit that thing, and went. Let's just say it didn't work out well, <laughs> I, and I didn't repeat it. Did you end up with, with grazed knees? Uh, yeah, grazed yeah, everything. Well, unfortunately, I was at least conscious enough to put the the ramp off to the side in the grass. <laughs> so I came down the driveway, veered off, then hit it. But yeah, it was it was not my best evening. <clears throat> but, well, on paper, it looked all good and proper. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. It was just in practice when it didn't work out. Well, I will say, it's kind of funny you mentioned uh, coming apart. It's, I'd still that banana seat huffy. We were getting ready to move 
make the move from our house. We we're going to go to a, a rental house for just a, a few months because the house we'd already bought in Florida, Dad had rented to a, a tenant. So we had to wait for them to have their lease finished before we could actually move into it. Right. So lo and behold, ours sold. So we had to just find a little temporary. So it was the day, I remember the movers were packing up and everything, and I'd been over to a friend's house. And I'm on the, the Huffy, and I'm coming back, and you get to where the yard ends, but we had curbs, like a yeah. eight-inch curb yeah. in that neighborhood. So I go to, like I always did, as I kind of get there, I'd lift up to kind of jump. Well, I pulled up, and those handlebars came right out of the head tube. <laughs> so I've got straight above my head with the handlebars, and that front wheel is just tick, 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 in any way it wants to. Right. And you know, for that split second, yep. you know, what's coming. Yep. And yep. I just laid it down, and my hands scraped. Ooh. And I remember coming in, and Mom having to get gauze around my hands. And here we are moving that same day, and oh, my gosh. One of the many, many to come, you know, with the... Yeah, so Bicycle that, antics. That's reminded me. That actually, one of my biggest accidents uh, pre-Formula One days, I mean, I've had a couple of fairly spectacular accidents in the pit lane, which I've written about. And we'll discuss at uh, some point. <laughs> yes, but one of my biggest accidents pre-Formula uh, One days was actually on a bicycle. Now, you've just reminded me of this. We used to, another hill, um, our, our area of England was full of hills, ups and downs, and green valleys, you know. And it's great fun when you're going down the hills, and of course, very hard work when you're going up the hills, but um, good for your health and good for your muscles, no question. <laughs> and I remember one day I was on my bicycle, I, I guess I would have been about 10 or 11, and I was, I was cycling from my home at the manor down into the village to see a good old uh, school friend of mine. And uh, I remember freewheeling down this hill, and it's just this hill seemed to go on for a, seemingly forever, right from close to my home, right down through the woods and into the village. And as we zoomed down this hill into the village, there was a filling station, a uh, gas station on the right hand side. And I was following uh, a mini, an 850 little mini car, yeah. you know, all over England at the time in the 60s and 70s. And uh, I was managing to, I was actually managing to keep up with this, you know, with this mini, sort of freewheeling behind it. That was the sort of how steep this hill was. Uh -huh. And then, this is the, like you just said, there's that one moment of realization with what is about to transpire. The mini braked to turn right to go into the filling station, and I thought. I've got two choices here. One is to go slamming into the back of this Mini, which I'm thinking is not going to be a good, a good day. I mean, that will be a bad day at the office. The other one is I can try and go to the right and get around the car before it turns into the filling station. Yep. And uh, I did manage to, I mean, this, this guy started to turn to the right and I zoom round him. I mean, 30 plus miles an hour, must have been. And uh, um, you talked about the curb, the height of the curb. And I just remember the front wheel of the cycle hit the curb on the right-hand side where this gas station was. And um, then, of course, the wheel collapsed. And I just remember just rolling on the ground, like boom, 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 boom. And then there's a stone wall there. I mean, how I didn't suffer serious injury, I'll never know. I mean, it was, it was, it was a pretty big shunt, I'll tell you. I scraped hands, scraped knees, scraped everything. Yep. Uh, but fortunately, and very sweetly, the, the chap in the Mini did the very decent thing and stopped and got out and made sure I was okay. And the people from the garage came running out and, is he okay? Is he okay? Is he still alive? <laughs> you know, and uh, again, the bicycle was wrecked. I mean, it looked like a small plane accident, quite frankly. There was stuff all over the place. But the chap in the, in the 850 Mini very kindly drove me back home, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and dropped me off at home. And then I had to explain to my parents what had happened, you know. And, Although it wasn't my fault, you always kind of feel guilty that it was my fault. You have to explain, what the hell have you been doing? You know, but, anyway. you know my, bicycles might be more collectible in England because every story ends up with a destroyed uh, <laughs> unit at the end. <laughs> yes, but, uh, well, yeah, I say it wasn't my fault. Of course, it was my fault. I should, I should never have been running so close to the medium front, and I should have been watching for any indication and all of that. But, uh, yes, I mean, I remember that being being quite the day and my knees were so badly scraped that um, uh, we had at the time when it was a children's convalescent home the manor they used to have nurses on, on, on in the manor and uh, I remember one of the nurses saying to my mum make sure he takes salt baths every day for a week uh, which would do two things one it's very good to stop any infection getting into the cuts and two it will teach him 
never to do this again. It's a nice because reminder, is it? <laughs> and those salt baths. A reminder, they, maybe not wow, so they, nice. they used to sting. They and they were awful. But um, yes, I mean, I do remember coming out of that week long treatment of salt baths and thinking, I'll, I will never, never do that again. <clears throat> well, never, never have a serious accident again for the rest of my life, gentle listener. Yes, well, that didn't. Well, let's quite keep it that out. way. <laughs> That's right. So yeah, then we uh, we moved. That was when we moved down to Florida. You know, about a year later, um, well, X months, or maybe six months, eight months. Um, then BMX bikes were becoming the rage. Yes. And I was re- I mean, again. I loved anything with wheels, and again took to bikes and loved them anyway. And also now we're in a small town, whereas in Knoxville I could ride them out my neighborhood, but we were near near some major roads, so I wasn't going to go too far anyway. But Leesburg, Florida, was much more small town. It's still a little city, but still. Um, I could get around a lot more and go do things more. Yeah. And I was, of course, older. Um, so then I got another Huffy, but it was a BMX Huffy called a Pro Thunder 4. And it was black with uh, yellow mag wheels, yellow Lester mag wheels, uh, had the pads on it and everything. It was a BMX bike. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. totally changed uh, the dynamic. And then, But you're starting to pick up with friends, and they have them too. And you're starting to kind of become, you know, your kind of group of kind of who you hang and who you run around with and we're going places on them and again in a town we could go uptown to you know see all of what's going on or we could go to a friend's house or a friend's house that lived you know good ways away yeah or we just go out you know and ride them and again there was definitely that era of all right these are the pieces we got to make something let's cobble something together and just <laughs> see how airborne we can get on it <laughs> and of course the concept of a helmet was just yes. totally foreign to yeah. anyone yeah. at the time yeah. of course yeah Forget, forget anything else you're going to wear that's going to help you. Yeah. But. Yes. I mean, I did have, <clears throat> I say I never had another accident quite as big as that one going down um, the hill into the village. But uh, I do remember, actually much later in life, I was, by this time, I was a young apprentice mechanic. But I, um, uh, I hadn't passed my driving test. And so I was working for the Mazda dealer, which was in the town, which was about... Let's say recent math, it was about 10 miles away from home. So I would cycle into work every day and cycle home, obviously. And I do remember coming home one night and it was winter time and it was pitch black and you couldn't really see anything. There was no street lights on and I'm cycling along, minding my own business, head down. Well, you know, you almost guess what's going to come next. Somebody had parked on the side of the road and I, you know, I had my head down and not really paying attention and bang, straight up, straight into the back of There's the another one. There's another one. So it wasn't, it wasn't that it was a huge accident, this one, and there was no damage on the car. And I did go into the house and say, excuse me, sir, I'm very sorry. I, I made contact with your car, but there's no damage. So that bit was okay. But unfortunately, the impact was enough that it bent the, uh, the frame of my bike and pushed... Uh, the, the forks, if you like, pushed the forks and the headset back so much so that the back of the front wheel was now contacting the frame. You know, so mm-hmm. I couldn't I couldn't ride it any longer. Yeah. Um, but I knew that I needed I needed a to get home. I was still about five miles away from home, and b I knew that I needed to get to work the next morning. So mm-hmm. I can't say that that was my first all nighter repairing that bike because well, I had to walk home for a start, drag, dragging the bicycle behind me. You know, and. Um, but I did spend at least six hours, I think, in the garage that night trying to figure out a way to get the frame, you know, back straight enough that I could use it the next yeah. morning again. Yes, but that was entirely my fault. And you feel, I mean, I see these videos online of people have done the same thing, you know, with, with motorcycles and scooters and cycles. But again, I have done that. Yes, simply not paying attention, just head down cycling against the wind. And just bang, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was enough that it bent the frame. I tend, to, I tend to always think in <laughs> Europe, right, they all yeah. pretty much, you know, we, again, we covered some choppers and some other fun. Were they were they twenty six inch bikes by then? Oh, the whole, yes, line, yes. The full, so, the full size I would with say the pro- large yeah, wheel. Proper grown up bikes. That's what I tend bikes. to think yeah, of. Yeah, proper grown up bikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but um, well, then mine. Then after I had this, that was my first foray into BMX. And that's what I could afford. Then I started saving up, and then I bought. I was able to buy a real BMX bike. And oh, wow. this, this is where, again, people that are listening, they were into BMX bikes, they're going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, we had, we had a, uh, there wasn't much, much opportunities to, you know, have the retailers in where I lived, but there was a little place in the mall, had a little tiny store, and they actually had a loft, so you'd go upstairs too, but it was called Sun Cycle. 
and everybody from Leesburg is going to remember this. Okay. But uh, they always had, you know, what you'd have is the Holy Grail, though. There'd be like the one hanging from the ceiling, which it's like a scene. That, remember in Wayne's World, when he, you know, the, the one guitar, and every time you walk in, the angels play? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. This was uh, hanging from the ceiling, and it was a PK Ripper. From SE Racing, and I mean, you just would just sit and almost drool. That was the one to have. Uh, aluminum frame yeah. and light as could be, and had every amazing component. They were amazing. Now the price tag went along with it. Right. But well, I couldn't swing that one. I was able to, you know, get together enough, and I let the other bike go and whatever, and I bought a mongoose. So that was mine. And then, then you know, everybody you know, started like upgrading. Then we started riding real BMX bikes. We didn't race. There really wasn't any tracks around or anything at that or any organized yeah. opportunities i guess we could have gone to orlando and done that but they become like what cars become to you as a later teenager i mean it's your you're you know you're associated with that that's yeah. what you ride that's what you get to places with and yeah all that. absolutely and again it's that it's that freedom of being able to just go somewhere away from home and that's what that's the biggest thing i always remember was just freedom yeah i want to know how many hundreds of miles I ended up putting on that bike because yeah. we were all over the place. Because, like I say, you know, when you wanted to be somewhere, that was your way of getting there. And, and we'd just go to each other's houses or go here, go there, go, uh, you know, make, if I needed to go to the store, you know, or whatever. I wanted something at, you know, the local Zaire, which is like Target or Kmart or wherever. I just hopped on the bike and went. Yeah. Or if mom, or, mom and dad would always go out on Saturday nights. I was kind of getting the age where I didn't always want to go with them. They'd leave me money for pizza. Yeah. I'd call the local pizza place, run down the bike, and come back with it. Yeah, that's fantastic. But, I remember, I mean, again, I've had this very unusual, quirky childhood of living in this country house in England. So we had long driveways. And, um, you know, growing up as a kid, I was allowed to cycle up and down the driveways as much as I wanted because hardly any, I mean, all, all but zero traffic. Yeah. Uh, but not was not allowed on the roads. I guess, you know, this is sort of eight, nine, ten years old, I suppose. And I just remember, again, that it was that one day when my dad gave me permission to go out of the gates of the manor house and, and cycle down the country lanes. And in that day, that moment, like that sense of freedom was like, wow, I'm allowed to be in the big wide world yeah. on my the own. The world is a thousand fold from yeah. what it used to be. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah, just... just um, wonderful memories of just cycling down these country lanes and just and and it was, it's that odd odd memory kevin of when we were in the family car and driving down the country lanes you knew the routes you knew the way like you knew this farm was on the left and that farm was on the right and there was a a right hand turn here or a left hand turn there <clears throat> but that sense of complete freedom and independence when you are cycling on your own and you go past the farm on the right and you go past the farm on the left and they become your memories your own independent memories yeah. of traveling not the families it's something completely different isn't it but you also you're going at a little bit slower pace obviously than a car and you notice more things yes you pick up on more yeah. nuances of you know oh yeah. this little dip in the yes. concrete is here yes and you know, this is That's where right. that fallen tree has the whatever, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. And, and you get even more of that, of course, if you're walking. But, yeah. you know, you, you pass and miss a lot of stuff in a car. That's exactly right. Yes. And it was things like, um, again, this is probably something that's come into use later on in my life, is you would become aware of where the different change to the asphalt surface was, right? Or tarmac, oh, yeah. as we would say. And you planned. Yeah, like you knew that halfway down this lane, expect a because yeah. then that was where the road was resurfaced, or you knew where the slight dip or the trench was, where someone had laid a pipe underneath the lane and not done a very good job of filling it back in. Yeah. You needed to be aware of where it was. That's right. And the other thing that I, that, that's, that, st that um, stays in my memory from that was when you ever you approached like um, a, a, um, a crossroads or a right hand turn or a left hand turn or we, would, we, had, we used to have a lot in England a lot of they were called triangles where sort of three roads had come together and there'd be a grass triangle in the middle and you had to sort of navigate your way around them but the thing that I remember most when I was on my cycle bicycle just cycling around was you would see where the cars had, had carried the gravel into that patch where no one, you know, no yeah. one travels over. You know, we, we see it now when we're driving around all day long. But I just remember being fascinated, like the, just the shape and the structure of where the gravel would end up where no tire would run over it. And it would form this sort of little 
like a mud bank or a sand bank around where the junctions were. Why that stick sticks yeah. in my mind, I don't know, but I just remember seeing it. So, oh, yes, I remember that. I remember the size of the gravel and amazing, yeah. Yeah, well, on the good side of, you know, going from A to B, you know, you, you know what to look out for, but you also know the fun stuff. Like, this is going to be a, this jump. I always know this jump is in this spot, and I'll... <laughs> Turn the corner, speed up, and hit it. You know, know how to hit it and get airborne and see if I did better than last time and keep going. But And then you had just, you know, you may cut through somebody's uh, circular driveway. You know, you never went around the corner, and you never know if they were mad at you about it or not. But you <laughs> always cut through the circular driveway, and it took you around the corner, and you just kept going. Yeah. And many times I would just do, do that or cut through a business, you know, how you cut through their parking lot or something like that. And was there a particular store or chain of stores whereas kids you knew that you would be able to get your bicycle repair not that not not to take it to be repaired but where you'd get your supplies from whether it's a new chain or mud guard or cotter bins or was you, it somewhere that you always used to go to we we would uh, get some stuff at that sun cycle and that was out at the mall you could not ride to it it was about eight miles away i mean i guess you could have but it's going to be a full good long t- time getting out there right um we had a schwinn schwinn shop near downtown so we would pop in there occasionally and i still remember we'd pop in there and there would be the guy back there with the one on a rack and he's he's working on a bike and they wouldn't pay a bit of attention to us they were right. just they knew we were there again and, and they always had bmx magazines on the table by the chairs and we'd look through those we'd seen them a thousand times and they'd have you know their the schwinn sting was the really cool bmx they had a frame hanging there yeah and we'd always you know kind of covet that yeah I'd just look at it yeah, that'd yeah, be yeah. pretty amazing to have yeah, that yeah but uh we we did our own work on our bikes. My dad had a great set of tools, so he had stuff that you could even, you know, adjust to the, the, the tension in the in the axle and everything of a wheel and stuff like that. Yeah. And and I was really fastidious about. I would break it apart every once in a while and regrease the bearings, you know, inside the head tube and the yeah, crank. Yeah. And I like doing that kind of stuff. But yeah. And were, were, were all those bearings, those little ball bearings, were they all free rolling ball bearings? So they just fall out and roll. No, they were one of those little rings. Oh, were they? Yeah, oh, that's be, very you know, posh. Yeah. Around, uh, so that was yeah. yeah and we, I'd, I'd in uh, soak them in, yeah. soak them in paint thinner, clean them out, <laughs> rub, rub them, and regrease them. And it was just therapeutic and, and such. But yeah. I will say that mongoose, by the time when I bought it, probably in '82. By the time I let it go in 87, I had changed every component on it except the frame, the fork, and the crank. Everything else had, had evolved. <laughs> so well, That's great. I have mag wheel. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you. I'll, somewhere I've got them. Pictures of the day I got it and then pictures of its last iterations yeah. of when I had it. I'd like to see it. I bet our, our, our listeners would like to. Yeah, but you wheel yeah. and deal in, with friends, too. You did, we did a lot yes, of horse yeah, trading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're always trading, trading. <laughs> you know, this, that. You know, yeah. I don't need this anymore. I've got this, or i got a new one of these. Do you want to you know, deal on the old one? And so we were always doing that kind of stuff. Our, our store uh, shop in England, never you would never call it a store, our shop for bicycle um, repair equipment and parts, was it was an automotive chain i'm not sure they still exist in england but somebody else somebody will tell me yes they do when i say they don't it was called halfords and there was a halfords in every little town in england and um they would sell every everything for cars really sounds kind of like a western auto here. okay maybe the similar thing like you know you all aftermarket nondescript parts you could get for cars would be in there plus a, a few brake pads and, and brake rotors and that sort of thing. Uh, small cans of um, aerosol paint, you know, with a little ball bearing in to shake yeah. up and all that stuff was there. Auto so, parts, hardware. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But it was uh, it was it was 90% car. Halford's Auto, let's call it. I can't remember what the tag name was. But they all had a little section for bicycles in there. And you could get the tires and pumps and cotter pins and chains and you know, stuff with the derailleur gears and all that sort of stuff was yeah. in there. And we would um, almost every Saturday catch the bus if you know into town, because that was quite a... I mean, again, I used to cycle into town every day when, when work took me there, but cycling into town was considered quite a long way. So we would tend to go in on the middle and red bus, buy things for our bicycles, go back and then, and then repair them and drive around the little country lanes. Because parents still didn't like us driving into town on those main roads, so mm-hmm. we would try and avoid that. So I do remember buying things like little, little packs, b- blister packs of two cotter pins for the, um, the cranks. 
because uh, when they'd start to wear, of course, you know, when you cycle along and it's sort of go kaboom, 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 and you know, yeah. it's so annoying, <laughs> so annoying. It's like a shopping cart now when I go shopping, and you, know, you, you you get a cart with a bad wheel that sort of bumps along, right? It always reminds me of a cotter pin failing on a bicycle. And uh, so that was a great lesson, early lesson in mechanics of using a file to reduce the size just by a little bit, like a sixteenth of an inch or so, of a brand new cotter pin, which is just a generic cotter pin. I mean, it certainly wasn't made for a rally bike, for example, or anything else. And making that a custom-made fit for one's bicycle, whatever it would be. You know, that was my first lesson in using a file and trying to create a flat surface uh, on a cotter pin. And one other thing I do remember is I must have had some birthday money uh, one year and I was in Halfords and they had a little speedo for the bike. Oh, it was yeah. cable driven yep. speedo. Yep. And and I thought, wow, this is, you know, what a cool thing. This How tech. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember buying it. But again, I could only have been nine or ten, something like that. I had no real understanding of how to fit it onto the bike. And I tried and couldn't, couldn't figure this thing out. And I went to my brother and my dad. They were, I think, were watching football on the TV on a Saturday afternoon when I got home. And uh, I should never have really disturbed them, when, certainly when my dad was watching soccer football on the TV on a Saturday afternoon. I knew this was, this was not a good thing. And he, he said, well, I'll sort it out later. I can't do it now. You know, I'm watching the football, blah, 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 blah. But so, and, and later that afternoon or Saturday evening, my, my brother and my dad fitted this speedo onto the bike for me now the the lesson in life from this comes from from the actual fitment of the speedo on the bike i felt so inadequate because i couldn't do it and i had to rely on my dad and my brother to do it for me and although they did it for me i could sense it was somewhat you know, there was a little resentment from my dad that he had to get up from the tv and go and do it and i just remember thinking i am never gonna put myself in that position again when i can't do it myself. Mm. I will learn how to make things, mechanical things work. Well, and then, and then to jump from that to World Championship Formula One cars. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it worked out for you. <laughs> I guess it, I guess, Kudos I, to you. I guess it paid up, but I do remember that life lesson. Yes, I, I'm not going to do this to myself again. I need to know how this works. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned adding something to a bike. It's, it, in the BMX days, the whole thing was light, 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 light. Right, right. So, Literally, the day I got the thing, the first thing I did is I stripped off the chain guard, the kickstand, every every reflector on it, which kids don't do this at home. <laughs> uh, right. But, yeah, we took everything off that wasn't yeah, necessary. To make it light. Yes, it, to yeah. make it as light as possible. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, that's the first lesson in racing, isn't it? Make yeah. it light. Make it strong. Make it light. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's right. S stripping the chain guards off was a, was a thing we used to do as, as well. And those old three-speed rally bicycles that were built to last a thousand years used to have i don't know if it was the same in the states kevin but the ones in england they were fully enclosed chain guards like there was no sign of the chain oh, really? it was completely shrouded no, we just usually have a little shield which, which was great at keeping your trousers clean you know oh, yeah, and yeah. you didn't it, it meant that you didn't need um there's a whole generation uh, bicycle that clip. have a clue what that is. Right, yeah. known as bicycle clips, weren't they? That was right, yeah. And I, 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 again, talking about my friends and um, my, my dad's friends or the, the grown-ups of the, of the area, you would often see when folks were going shopping to the market or in the stores to buy whatever they were buying in town, a lot of the chaps would leave their bicycle clips on their trousers when they'd cycled yeah. into town. Yeah. So you'd see them walking around. You know, with Why take bicycles. them off? You're just going to put them on in 10 that's minutes. Right. Now, that's something I have ne not seen for decades. But, yeah, the vast majority of folks walking around the markets would, would have bicycle, <laughs> bicycle clips on, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so those, those very heavy-duty chain guards uh, were, were made to get away with that. You know, you wouldn't need bicycle uh, clips at all because the chain was fully encased. But as kids, of course, in the in the quest for making your machine as lightweight as possible, oh, yeah. that was one of the first things that that, 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 that were taken off and uh, never seen again. So it's a bit like buying collectible books. One of the first things that a book collector will say is, has it got the dust jacket on it? Because the dust jacket makes such a difference. Or if you're buying collectible Star Wars figurines, is it in the original box? Oh, yeah. Huge um, difference. Uh, yeah. And with a three-speed old rally bike, is has it got the original chain guard on it? Because so many of them were taken off and thrown away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess 
we've come to the end of our conversation today, haven't we? We've kind of run out of time. Unfortunately, we have. That was a fun, fun conversation. Good, good. Yeah. Good suggestion from Gary. Yeah, well done, Gary. And uh, again, gentle listener, if you want to send in suggestions, let's do that. Contact at magitandtheotherguy.com. That is correct. Yeah. See you next time. Bye. Next time. Bye. <laughs> You're laughing at my bike again, aren't you? That's right. Bye.